You know, while I was standing at the back, I realized something. I didn't, when I was preparing my message, I didn't see it, but I realized something. How many things did Jesus ask? I mean, how many things did Jesus' disciples ask him to teach? Did he say, teach us how to lay hands on the sick? Did he say that? Did he say, teach us how to feed the poor? Did he say that? Did he say, teach us how to do miracles? What did, he, what did they ask him? They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, it's the funniest thing is when you ask people to pray, especially if they're a little bit new in the faith, it's like one of the worst questions you can ask anybody. It's like if I go over the crowd and I look at your beautiful faces and I think, mm, who can I ask to open up in prayer for us? You all get short in your seats. It's like, you. Lord, please. Then you pray, Lord, please. Don't let it be me. Please, 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 please. But when we're looking for a miracle, when we're looking for prophecy, it's amazing. You sit in the church and all of a sudden you're tall. It's like. So today I want to share with us the word of God. Heavenly Father, I'll just bring every single person here to you right now in Jesus' name. Lord, often we say to Lord, Lord, I need a parking. Any of you ever pray for a parking? Oh, and then you're like so chuff. Check, check, check. Right at the front door. Well, I think the many South Africans had prayed really, 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 really hard today. And unfortunately, God only listened to the prayers of the Argentinians. We like went to the back of the queue. But seriously, so Father, just lift us up. I pray that we can lift our hearts. We can open our minds. That we, you will open our spiritual ears and our spiritual eyes. Father, we pray for the softening of our hearts, Lord. Because when we see scripture, the first thing that comes to mind, Lord... That we say is, oh, I know that one. So we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you know the Lord's Prayer? Oh, that's good. The rest of you don't know the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, oh, yeah, that, that's the one. Yeah. There you go. Hey, slim, eh? Slim, yeah. Now, what... One of the things that I found out was that prior to Jesus praying and showing them how to pray, little reference was ever made. In fact, no reference was made to our Father. Did you know that? There's scriptures where God is as Father of the nation of Israel, but never our Father. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6, it says this. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? So there's the prophet speaking to the nation of Israel and saying, Is God not your father? In Isaiah 63, verse 16, it says, Doubtless you are our father. Though Abraham was ignorant of us, and Israel does not acknowledge us, O oh Lord, you are our Father, the Redeemer, everlasting is your name. But nowhere does it say, our Father. The disciples and those around Jesus could have asked him for anything, I mean, how many of you want to walk in the prophetic? You, you want to be a prophet. So you're going to say, oh, teach me to be a prophet. Or I want to be a pastor. Teach me how to be a pastor or a missionary or a teacher. We often ask in people. And for teachers, you know what it's like. Is there, There's a hunger and thirst for um, knowledge. But there can be nothing worse than when you're teaching and there's no response back. This last week... Uh, uh, a few of us went to a school to go and do some voluntary work. And I want to tell you the worst thing to do to me is be, and I'm saying, pick up your pen. No, pen, 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 pen. And we all like that. We hate that there's no feedback and there's no response, especially if we're teaching. Amen. 
And yet Jesus, they say to Jesus, teach us how to pray. But if we look and we see how that came about, we will see the model prayer. So Jesus first taught in, in John 14, 6 to 7, he said, Jesus said to them, to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you will know him and have seen him. To the, up to that time, only Moses had seen God face to face. And he looked like he had been in a nuclear explosion because the Bible says that he glowed. And it had a profound effect in him, but there was no one-on-one. -on -one. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, if you have known me, you would have known the Father. Galatians 4, 46 says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that they might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Romans 8, 15 also talks about the Father. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Father. And Jesus says, pray like this. In this manner, our Father. How is our relationship with our God? He's God the provider, God the redeemer, God the healer, the God of peace, the God our banner. And we go on and we list all the names of God, especially when we're really crying out to God for something. And how often do we pray, God, my Father? What is it about us that it's so difficult to have a relationship with God, our Father? So what I want us to do is, who remembers the, the Lord's Prayer? Let me hear. One, two, three. Seriously, one, do we, I want you to pray it as a corporate collective. Don't rush ahead, don't lag behind. One, two, three. That prayer starts with our Father. And the only reason we can cry out, Abba Father, our Father, is because of the finished word of Jesus Christ on the cross. There are many people that don't even refer to God because they don't know God. We live in a country here where God is unknown. Jesus is unknown. The Holy Spirit is unknown. And for us that do know it and be able to recite the, the Lord's Prayer. And you know, many of us, when we say the Lord's Prayer, we actually just whack through it. Eh? Our Father, our Father, our Father, our Father, Amen. Oh, that was hectic. But today I want us to go line by line, slowly through. You heard what Jesus said. Hello, name. What does it what mean this thing's driving me insane huh? blessed hope what else set apart is
more. Tell me more. Tell me more. Hello. Holy. What else? Holy. Hallowed means sacred, holy, separate, and therefore God Himself is to both be uniquely valued above everything. Do we value God above everything? You know, there was a boxing match yesterday. There were 92,000 people watching that boxing match. 92,000 people with their telephones up and screaming out a person's name and screaming out his name. Where was God in all of that? And for all the name calling and all the Alec, uh, accolades and all the training and all the money, that person lost the fight. Will they be calling out his name today? 92,000 people. And I can tell you, I don't think those tickets were cheap. And yet we don't value our father. We don't hallow his name. We don't keep holy his name. In fact, we quick to blaspheme his name. We quick to abuse his name. We even quick enough to deny his name. Luke one forty nine says this: For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Holy. To be holy, exalted, worthy, complete devotion. As one perfect in goodness and righteousness. We are to consider God's greatness and his majesty. Amen. Your kingdom come. See, it's funny how earlier on John actually looked at my notes. And his comment was, ooh, this is long. Did you say that? You said that, eh? Hey? Ooh, this is long. I said, it's not that long. It's just the Lord's Prayer. But today we want to have a deeper look into the Lord's Prayer so that the next time we utter God's name and consider His holiness, we will know what it is when we say, Your kingdom come. Yet Matthew 6.33 says this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to us. How many of us truthfully put God as a priority and the kingdom of God as a priority in our lives? Uh, I, I, know I seem to be picking on the teachers, but I can relate a little bit to it. Do you just go into a lesson or do you have a lesson plan? You have a lesson plan? You know, and it gives you a guideline about where you're going to go and what you're going to do. And then it, it may just hit a little bit of a hiccup, but, but you've got that plan. Am I right? And people think that if you're a teacher, what happens is you go in for a couple of hours and then you go home and you chill and you do nothing. It doesn't work like that. So you put time, you put effort into what you're doing. Do we put the same, same time and effort into serving the true and the living God? Do we seek his kingdom and do we seek his righteousness or do we pop in on a Sunday morning, do our obligation and then we live our lives like there's no tomorrow until the next weekend? Romans 14, 17 says this, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Your will be done. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? If I had to ask each one of us, what does, what does God require from you? Ah, oh, that I must, oh, I need to obey the commandments. I need to love my neighbor. Uh, let me see, let me see. Oh, oh, yeah. When I get round to it, pay my tithes. Uh, I need to pray. I need to be good. And we go through all of those things. But look what the Bible says. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to have mercy, and to walk humbly 
with your God. This weekend, sports people got humbled. Humbled. That boxer, he made a statement and he said to his opponent, I will dig your grave. I mean, how harsh can you be? Do we walk justly? Do we have a sense of justice in our lives? Now, I know none of you are like that. When you get on your motorbike, you, you diligently put on your helmet and then you ride carefully down the road and you don't speed and you, you don't wave at people with your other finger and all of those things. I know you're like good guys. Do we walk justly? If we go into the store and an item's priced incorrectly, do we act justly and say, sorry, you've, you've undercharged me? It's those little things. Do we have mercy? You know, one of the things that amazes me about people is the moment something is said, the first thing we do is we tell them what they're doing wrong. And it, regardless if they're in ministry or in secular life, the first thing is, oh, but that's not right. Do we have a sense of mercy? You see, God was merciful to every single one of us. Every single one of us has a history and we have a story from where we've come from. But it was the love and the mercy of God that allowed us to be sitting here today. Not your good works, not my good works, but it was the love and the mercy of God. Do we show the same mercy? And it says that we need to walk humbly. The world doesn't teach us to be humble. It says, you number one. There's a, there's a brand of fuel in South Africa and it says, with us, you're number one. Are we? But, or is he number one in our lives? What's the other thing that God requires from us? It's in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always. I want to know how much rejoicing there's going to be this morning while people are in a state of mourning. And all the couch experts, including me, oh, you know what, he could have got, hey, he could have got that kick over. Why didn't he kick over this? Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he keep his right hand up? Then he wouldn't be knocked out. Why, 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 why? And we are specialists in everything that we have to say. Is this a true story? It's true, hey? It's amazing how much advice we have for other people. We do. You know, if I was you, this is what I would have. Well, here's the thing. You're not me. And I'm not you. But what is God's will for our lives? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. How much prayer is required to pray without ceasing? Who can tell me time-wise how much prayer is that? One hour, two hours, 10 hours, 24 hours. But if I'm honest, I slip a quick prayer in just before I sleep. Oh, Lord, please don't let me die of a heart attack in my sleep. Amen. And then I wake up. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you kept me alive. Can't wait for breakfast. In everything, give thanks. Are we thanking God for the hardships? Are we thanking God uh, for, you know, my dear friend over here, he's got matching bandages. He fell off his bike. And it's so easy to say, oh God, how could you allow these things to happen to me? Why are people so cruel in the world? Why is this? Why is that? Are we thankful? Are we thankful for our governments? Are we thankful for our bosses? Or do we spend time around the water fountain gossiping about the boss, our supervisor, how lousy and cruel they are? It says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And one of my favorite scriptures is in Romans 12, 1 to 2. It says this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know what is the good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Are we living in the good? Are we living in the acceptable? And are we living in the perfect will of God? Your will be done. Where does God's will need to be done? Where? Say it. On? Well, this is what the Bible has to say say in Genesis 2-7. And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Genesis 3-19. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it... Out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. On earth, the will of God needs to be fleshed out on earth, or in earth, as it is in heaven. Are we living out God's will daily in our flesh? I know I don't. I struggle every day. Every day it's a battle against anger. It's a battle against um, thoughts. It's a battle against all kinds of stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, but Lord, you're so good. How's this earth doing? Is this earth bringing glory to God? Is this earth the temple of the Holy Spirit? Is this earth worthy of being called sons and daughters of the Most High God that we can cry out, Abba, Father? How many of you eat bread? Anybody eat bread? Hey, if you're South African, you eat bread. We eat bread with Sunday roast. We eat, uh, I mean, you go to a buffet, it's vasi brood. We do. Every other country eats rice and we eat bread. Now, how many of you love moldy, stale bread? Come on. I mean, there can be, for those of you that come from Cape Town, you know winter is the best time for moldy bread. It looks like a forest, a green forest grain on that slice of bread, and you go, oh, oh, the aroma. Oh, those little spores of, of the mold starts floating up your nose. You're so excited about spreading your black cat peanut butter and your all girl apricot jam in there because you're going to clap that thing. Am I right? No. To us, there is nothing better than freshly baked bread. And if it's still hot, you take that fresh butter. And, and you're not shy with the butter. Never mind cholesterol. Cholesterol's out the window. You clap that thing, put it on, and a thick layer of uh, black cat peanut butter, and then a thick layer of jam, and it's just like... Because they say, peanut butter sticks to the roof of your mouth. Amen. What's my point? We don't want to eat stale, moldy bread. And yet, we're not prepared to receive the daily bread from God, which is his word. Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. Who received some daily bread today? Who received some fresh bread today? What did God say to you scripturally today? How did the, the, the Bible jump out at you and you thought, wow, Lord, I've never seen that scripture like that before. Or are we reading everybody else's books, listening to everybody else's podcasts and watching the YouTube channels and even, even listening to me? You know, is this where you get it? Are we coming daily to Jesus? To the word, to the living word and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Are we running on yesterday's miracles and yesterday's testimonies? We do. Oh, I remember the good old days. Eh? Oh, I was sitting with Grace earlier on in, in the children's church and we were just talking. And I could remember how, what a bad student I was. And I would stand in front of the headmaster's office and how he would stop and look me up and down. And all I could think was, hey, quick, quick six shots. And then it's done. But no, he'd walk away and come back and give me the look. And 
And that would just be in my mind. And, and I was reminiscing about the good old days. You see, I'm the only one that's guilty of that. Where I considered the life that God delivered me from, set me free from, still is so clear and so vivid in my mind. I can remember as though it was yesterday. But do I remember the word of God that he gave me this morning? That little encouragement. Just phone so and so and, and tell them I love them. What's important to us? Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be full. Are we hungry? Are we thirsty for the word? To do the will of God. Are we thirsty and hungry to fulfill the great commission? What's the next line in the Lord's Prayer? Who can remember? Uh, you're going to have to go quickly. Uh, uh, hey, you're on form today, Brabo. Forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our debts. Some versions say trespasses, some say debts. 1 John 1, 8 to 10 says, If we say we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all un unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Often I spend time with people and they, they say, you know, uh, I know there's something wrong with me and uh, I want to be delivered. And I think I'm either being oppressed or possessed by demons. We say demons. Yeah. Demons. Yeah. <laughs> I say, well, just confess your sins. Yeah, but you, you know, there's so many things that I did and so many things that... If you confess, God is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and all your unrighteousness. Because he's a just but merciful God. Amen. The biggest step to deliverance is that first recognizing your sin, acknowledging your sin, confessing your sin, repenting from your sin, and then sinning no more. It starts with realizing there's something not right. Amen. Amen. I thought I was just chatting to myself. Here. So there are two types of sin. Do you know them? What are the two main types of sin? Come on. This is a quiz. Woo. Any takers? Takers? Sins of commission. Things that you've done that are not pleasing to God. Amen. Now, I mean, we all got our own little list. And depending on your, your um, background, you will know that there are little sins, medium sins, and large sins, and then sins that are just going to kill you. <coughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> sin is sin. Sin is sin. If you go and you look when Jesus addresses the different sins, he doesn't put them the top, the bottom. He says, they're all the same. Forgive out. So the sins of commission are the things that you do that you shouldn't do. And the sins of omission are the things that you should do that you don't do. Make sense? But isn't it amazing? We want to be forgiven of our sins, but what is the criteria to being forgiven of our sins? Hey. Hey. Another point for you. You're doing well. Look at this. As we forgive our debtors, for if you forgive men the trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. We profess to be born again, blood washed, spirit filled, glowing in the dark, walking on water believers, where God is almighty, God is all good, God is all anything, but you have ought with each other. 
you know, I want to tell you, I will forgive you, but I will never forget what you did. You're in trouble. You're walking in unforgiveness. And that unforgiveness will start to turn into resentment, and that resentment will have a root of bitterness, and it will go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper till it's almost impossible to forgive those people. And yet if we consider what God's forgiven us and we measure back, Lord, uh, how much grace did you allow in my life? For me to forgive somebody else is quick because he's had to forgive me of so many things. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32. And this is an instruction from Paul. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Amen. Now, what does the next slide say? Come on. Forgive, forgive our debtors and Ah, lead us not into temptation. Who knows that Jesus was tempted after fasting 40 days and 40 nights? Who knows that Jesus was tempted? We all know that, huh? What were the three main temptations? Physical? You read in my notes. She's got, she got a copy of my notes. So her answers don't count. Mm, sneaky. Physical, emotional, and the control of the heart. And those are the three areas that the enemy attacks us. You know, he said to Jesus, uh, Matthew 4, 1 to 11. I know it's long. But this is good bread, healthy, fresh bread from heaven. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Did you notice the demon didn't lead Jesus into the desert? It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted of the devil so that Jesus could show each one of us that he was tempted but he did not sin. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the son of God, then throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall give angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Then Jesus said to him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me then jesus said to him away with you satan for it is written you shall worship the lord your god and him alone shall you serve then the devil left him and behold the angels came and ministered to him now i gave you a scenario earlier on Ninety-two thousand people in a stadium crying out shouting out somebody's name we go to music concerts and we shout out somebody's name we even go to christian gatherings and we shout out somebody's name because they're the ones delivering the worship and we're failing to see the one that should be worshiped we start to worship the worshipers we start to worship the preachers we start to follow the the pastors we start to follow the religions the denominations we follow something, but we fail to follow Jesus. And you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Who are we serving? Oh, you know, my children are everything. I will give my life for my children. Would you give your life to Jesus? 
And would you give your life to the kingdom of God? Every single one of us will face any of those three temptations throughout our lives till we die. But let us not get to the place and say, oh Lord, uh, but you tempted me. You could have saved me. Why did you, Lord, why did you let me watch pornography? Now you switch the computer on and you push the button. If you're struggling in an area, let's say you're struggling with pornography. Here's a little clue. Don't put the app on your computer or on your phone. Hey, if you struggle with gambling, don't hang out in casinos. You understand what I'm saying? But then we say, but Lord, why didn't you, why did, because he's given us, each one of us, free will. And we need to exercise it. But deliver us from the evil one. And the way to do that daily is to put on the whole armor of God. It's, it's just, I know it sounds obvious, but it's like getting on your bike without a helmet and then you all miff because you got a bump on your head and you don't remember anything and you won't talk to anybody. Well, what happened? I fell off my bike. I can't believe it's such a stupid bike and I whacked my head. Were you wearing a helmet? No. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in, in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, as a result of all these attacks coming, therefore... That is why you have to take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and then die, having done all to stand. Are we standing? Are we waiting on God? Are we standing on his promises? Are we resisting the devil? Or are we in such a state that we get moved to and fro, to and fro, to and fro? And I want to tell you something. There's so much literature and, and, and resources out there that has God-like sounding information in it. And immediately we follow that. Oh, but you know, it sounded so spiritual. Well, Satan is so spiritual. <laughs> we need to be careful. Amen. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. God does not share his glory. God gives us access through his, to his power through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But it's always his power. It's his ministry. It's his children that we have the privilege of bringing up. It's his wife. That he gives to us so that in the time we spend together we can love our wives. It's his husband that he gives to wives that will love you, love you, love you. It's his parents that as children, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. You see, when we do the basics simply, to seek God, his kingdom and his righteousness becomes a very, very simple thing. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. I trust that you will walk away from this place and the next time you pray the Lord's Prayer, that you won't just rush through it. Spend time. This is only a few things. I'm sure you, God will reveal even more to you than he does to me. Because he likes you more. Because you're his favorite. Amen. And you know, when we seek his face and we seek his will, the Holy Spirit's desire is that we know 
more. Our relationship with the Lord is built up and, and gets better and better. Amen. Amen. 